Good evening, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Gareb, Executive Director of the Wildenstein Plattner Institute, and welcome to tonight's event, Photographers on Bearden. Our hosting of this program coincides with the release of portions of the Romare Bearden papers on the WPI Digital Archives, which I encourage all of you to explore on <clears throat> our website, wpi.art. Please refer to the link in the chat box for direct access. Included among the Bearden papers are many resources that are central to the WPI's research on the forthcoming Romare Bearden Catalogue Raisonné, which we are preparing with the assistance of the Romare Bearden Foundation. Incidentally, our work with the Bearden papers and how they inform the Catalogue Raisonné project will be the subject of a talk at the 51st annual Arliss North America Conference in Mexico City in April 2023. So for those of you who are going to Arliss and are going to be in Mexico City, please keep that in mind and come hear our discussion. Now, for tonight, we will be hearing from two key photographers in Bearden Circle whose photographic works are featured in the digital archives and play an important role in documenting the artist's legacy. Frank Stewart has made photographs on a wide array of subjects, but is best known for his images of jazz musicians. Mr. Stewart is formerly the senior staff photographer for Jazz at Lincoln Center, and his work will be subject of a retrospective opening at the Phillips Collection next year. Chester Higgins Jr. served as a staff photographer for the New York Times from 1975 to 2014. He has made a compelling record of the life and culture of African Americans and the people of the African diaspora with a particular focus on their faith and practice. Both Frank Stewart and Chester Higgins created well-known portraits of Bearden and they considered the artist an important mentor. They will be joined in a conversation by Dr. Dalila Scruggs, Curator of Photography and Prints at the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture. We are pleased to have all three of them here with us tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to outline the format of tonight's event. Our invited speakers will be in discussion for about 45 minutes, at which point they will be joined by Dr. Kamara Holloway, the WPI's project manager from the Bearden Catalog, for the Bearden Catalog Raisonné, who will be taking questions from the audience through the Q&A feature, not the chat feature, the Q&A feature. So please put your questions in Q&A. And now I will turn the screen over to Dr. St to Dr. Scruggs, who will begin the evening's event. Over to you, Dr. Scruggs. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much. I want to thank everybody at the Wilderstein Plattner Institute for inviting me, and especially my thanks go out, goes out to you, Frank and Chester, for um, giving me the honor to spend some time with you today. I also want to acknowledge the art historians and scholars that really laid the groundwork for this conversation, most especially Hugh Klein, who's done such extensive work on Romeo Beaton, but of course also uh, scholars like Deborah Willis, who created the field of the history of black photography that has allowed us to talk so you know, eloquently about your work. Um, today, just so that the audience knows and also to remind you both, um, I'm hoping that we can have a really open conversation about Rowan Mayberry. You both write so lovingly about him in your respective books. Um, on, that include a discussion of Bearden and, and you both have such extensive relationships with him that I really want you all to feel free to talk with one another, ask each other questions, interrupt me. But just so that we're on the same page, uh, I'm hoping that the flow of conversation can really start with Romare Bearden, the man himself, and then we can go outwards towards his influence on you both. And then ultimately thinking broadly about uh, what it means to photograph the creative process. And so we have slides that I'm hoping we can that can support the conversation. In some cases, we'll dwell on some images, and I invite you to really unpack them and talk about the composition. In other cases, because of time, we may have to kind of flip through them a little bit more um, hastily than we would want. <laughs> so that's the plan. Um, and so let's. I want to start with a, an easy question, but also really, uh, I think, a, a good way to ground the conversation. And so we can go to the first slide. And I want to talk about meetings. Like, 
I want to know how you met each other, and then let's talk a little bit about how you met Romare Bearden. So let's start with each other, and I brought this image just because it, you're both, you know, fresh in the street photographing for at, um, for the 90th birthday of Gordon Parks, but I really want to talk about how you met each other. Chester, would you like to start? No, no Frank, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, Chester gave an uh, in-house uh, workshop back in the early 70s in, uh, in Brooklyn, and that's how I met him. Uh, I think a few people from Kamoinga. I'm a member of the Kamoinga workshop, so uh, we, we came, myself, Danny Dawson, uh, Lou Draper, I think Sean was there present. And that's how we, we that's how I met uh, Chester, and then we were friends ever since. And I was like 75, 76, something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> well, so, sort of, but you know, I, I, I don't, I can't, now that he mentioned it. Um, but you know, um, um, Frank has been one of those guys who've been around the jazz scene um, and the music scene. So, there have been situations from time to time that I run into him as, you know, as how we photographers are. We each are doing what we do and, and sometimes those circles loop and it's, it's always good to see each other uh, doing uh, what we do. Uh, and, um, uh, and because we do what we do because yes, we need to make a living, but we do what we do because we're committed to this culture mm -hmm. and to showing people um, the many manifestations of this culture or as I say, my mission is to show the full agency of black life. And I think all of us do that. And that's why we, that's why we pick up the camera to work um, because we're trying to show things that are under the radar that the major media is missing or don't know how to value its significance. So it's great that, the, that we photographers, Frank and I are making the record for uh, that exists now while we're living, so that other people who are not living in this time would be the beneficiaries of our vision and our dedication uh, and our point of view. Um, we're going to circle back definitely to this idea of like revealing and, and seeing a new, but I want to talk about making a record and specifically you have documented both of you. Um, your relationships with uh, Romare Bearden. So um, let's go to the next slide and get started with um, how you met Romare Bearden and some of the photographs that you have. So Chester, we're gonna start with you. Well, I met Romy because I was doing this book on, um, I did, I'd done a book uh, called Black Woman. It's my first book. And I had been living uh, my summers in, uh, in West Africa, in Ghana, the summer of 72 and 73 in the summer of 74 in, in Senegal. But I think it was between my 72 and 73 when I returned to, to the United States, I wanted to do a book on, on black men. And I happened to see, I'm not sure if it was in a publication or if it was in a, 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 a gallery. I happened to see Romy's work on uh, Sin K. Sin K is the African who led a rebellion, a coup on, on a ship, uh, on a slaving ship coming to the Americas and took over the ship. And these Africans were then taken to Boston and they, uh, they uh, I think um, one of the founding fathers turned out to be uh, one of their uh, advocates and they won their freedom to go back home. Uh, so to me, uh, Romy's attention to this narrative that involved a, a, a story of six struggling success of African people, I found very attractive because I have been living among my cousins for at least six months and three months takes. And, and I've been learning things that you just don't learn if you're an African-American. Yeah. These things are just not a part of our history. These things that you learn on the continent, maybe Romy picked this up learning it in, in Paris, uh, I'm not sure, but as but I thought it was I was really struck by this, so I made it a, uh, my mission to find this man. So I start asking around, asking around, and finally 
I found that where he lived and I found a phone number and I called him up and I says, you know, I love what you're doing with, uh, with your African themes. And I've been traveling and living in Africa in the short term. Could I come and make pictures of you because I want to do this book? So I came and I made this picture of him with his, with his cat Chippo and uh, uh, um, e uh, painting on his easel. And that began a, um, I guess, a 30 year relationship. Uh, but that is how, that's why I sought him out. And um, I was very pleased um, that because of his work. Wonderful. Um, okay, so let's flip through some more of these photographs and if you have more to um, add. So, so here, you have me, you, here you have me at my very first exhibition. It's in the West Village in a gallery run by this Jamaican guy. Uh, it's called Acts of Art. And in it, uh, Romy invited some of his friends. You, you see his wife to the right, Nanette, and you see Herb Gentry, and then myself on the left, and you see uh, uh, Woodruff. Um, and I don't know who's on the far left, but you see me and my Ghanaian, <laughs> and my Ghanaian dashiki. So this is 70, um, this is when the book Drums of Life came out in uh, 74. And this is, uh, and so this is my subject uh, matter, inviting all his friends to come. Now, Gentry was in, he had been living in Sweden at the time, and he was in time was a favorite. And then the Hill Woodruff was another favorite of his. And I was just really touched that uh, all these guys showed up with Romy and Nanette. And uh, you see Romy as uh, old men who, who I'm used to this look where they're always sizing you up. They're, they're making, they're measuring you up to see how, how you measure to, you know, is this kid, you know, serious or what's going on and but <clears throat> Romy you know also was very much a supporter of other artists yeah. I think I was I don't know how many other photographers in his life other than me and Frank but he but his support mostly was for uh, painters and sculptors and that's what led him and his friends to set up uh, a cooperative uh, Sinke gallery so that those young people who they realized had good work who came that they were aware of, it gave them a setting in which to show their work. So I think Senke began in the in the public theater before it found its own place. And that's where he so doing in between shows, he and, and his friends would make uh, have judgment about which artists they wanted to show. And they would either give a one man show or a group show. Uh, every, I think every six weeks. Uh, so I feel that um, <clears throat> Romy was, well, I know that Romy was a beacon to so many uh, because people respected his work, they respected his judgment, and they respected his, um, uh, you know, he was a, a writer, uh, so they respected his intellectual capacities as well. And all of that uh, it led to a very dynamic community surrounding his life. Yeah. Um, how does that resonate with you, Frank? Um, uh, Brent Edwards, one of my colleagues here, who's a scholar of comparative literature and English, he talks about the fact that one of Bearden's, perhaps one of his most persistent qualities is that he has a devotion to working with others and creating that artist community. Um, you spent 20 years with him. Would you like to talk, respond to that idea? Well, yeah, he was, uh, he was a champion of young, young Black artists. And uh, we would go to uh, St. K opening all the time. I think it was uh, Ernie Critchlow and uh, Norman Lewis and Romy who were on the board and they were like the people that chose the artists and they were hard, hard critics. If you knew Ernie or if you knew uh, Norman, <laughs> they're very hard critics. I'm from the South and Romy was from the South and you know, we told all kinds of stories. So uh, Norman and them, we have a saying in the South that if you want to talk about somebody, you talk about their feet. Oh boy. <laughs> So Norman would talk about their feet. <laughs> well, you all three have that that Southern connection, Chester as well, right? Yeah, I'm from Alabama, uh, which yeah. is further further south than and the furthest south than all of them. Okay. Hell Woodruff had an experience in Alabama. He did a great mural at Talladega College, 
Um, and and Atlanta, he he was in uh, he was in Atlanta too. Okay, so you know, and you know that's the that was a the original marketplace for African artists is the HBCUs. Uh, even so many of these people uh, grew up in the HBCUs as instructors and doing their art on the side. You, know, you have a lot of them um, of, uh, that landed in Howard, but uh, Howard Fisk, uh, Tuskegee- and Hampton. And Hampton, yes. <clears throat> Maybe we should advance to the next couple of slides and, and, and turn it over to, let's linger, but let's turn it over to Frank to talk a little bit about his slides. So, <laughs> Is my first slide. Those were his grandparents, the Kennedys, and they were uh, Duke Ellington's. Those were his great grandparents. They were Duke Ellington's grandparents. So I found out that Romy was second cousin to Duke Ellington. You know, and in around 1975, I say, "Man, why didn't you tell me about Duke Ellington? Man, we could have been hanging out with Duke." <laughs> you know, <laughs> Duke died in '74. You know, <laughs> so uh, that was a joke you know, that we had with each other. And uh, so this is in his studio. And one day he had a poster of his great grandparents. And, uh, you know, Al Murray, does Al Murray come up? The name Al Murray comes up? Yep. Al Murray yep. was right there with uh, Romy all the time. He, in fact, I came to the studio one day and I, he had all of these, uh, collages all strewn around the studio says, so hey man, you gotta get these out of here. He said, oh no, no, no. I can't, I have to wait till Al comes and names them. <laughs> <laughs> so we had that kind of dynamic going too. Nice, nice. Let's go to the next slide. Well, you know, he was, jazz was so much of him. He was just. Oh yeah, well, jazz was part of, you know, that, that was the fabric that was, that yeah. wove all through yeah. everything, you know? Yep. We're going to talk more about jazz too. So, like, let's hold on to that one. Um, I, let's go to the yeah. Let's go to this slide because I, you know, uh, Bearden as a pedagogue is something that's really interesting. And so, I wonder if you could talk more about this photo, Frank. Yeah, he's talking about uh, Duncan. Well, you know, Bearden was a historian. You see all those books behind him in the, in his studio in his loft. He was a voracious reader and he, you know, he was, among other things, he was a uh, historian, uh, especially black painting history. You know, he, you have a Tanner in there, you have a Duncanson, and he, he was giving a lesson to these young black kids at the Mint Museum. They had a, they had a show up in a small gallery of uh, African-American painters. So that's what this is right here. Um, let's go ahead. Um, yeah, so here, forgive the quality of the image on the right, but as I was looking through your both of your work, particularly in um, the archives, the Beard and Papers, um, a trend, this is a hypothesis, you can let me know if I'm wrong, a trend emerged for me, which is that um, Chester, in many occasions, the photographs that at least that I've seen, you put the viewer right into um, Beard and circle, right? Um, immerse us into the, the relationships that Bearden had with other artists. And Frank, you have those as well, but going through your book, um, I started to also notice that there were, um, there was a way that you were documenting Bearden as part of an art world system and, and the ways that he was moving through openings and, and meetings with dealers. And so I'm wondering if you both um, think that that's a fair generalization or if you have another interpretation. And then um, my question to you specifically, um, Frank, is to talk a little bit more about what it means to photograph an artist in that system, you're in, in the art world. Um, I'll stop there. Well, I'll, I'll start out. You know, if Bearden came into the room, he'd be, you know, you, you'd say, well, who is this guy? You know, because he, Everybody, he was like a magnet. Everybody uh, wanted to talk to him. He, he wanted to tell him stories. He wanted to tell them stories. So he would draw a crowd all the time. So on the right, that's a California place called the Art Garden. And that's a guy in the back, uh, in back of him to his right named Sam Shaw, who's we a great We can go artist. to the next slide to get a little closer up, I think. Let's go to the next one. This, this must be Chester's. 
And <laughs> we'll go back to Chester in a minute. Let's say, since okay. you're talking about this, you were going to read the image and talk about who's in the background. Okay, this guy uh, to the right is Sam Shaw, and he was uh, a great director of movies. And I don't know who the rest of the people are. Uh, they, they were foreign to uh, both me and Romy. Yeah. So he's meeting new people all the time. And you can see how people are just gravitating towards him. Totally, he becomes the epicenter of this photograph. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, I also think that you can play a little bit of like, where is Waldo in terms of, for example, June Kelly. And in your photographs, you can see her moving through the spaces and her relative position as, her, as his June, dealer. June was his manager at that time. And the whole time I was with him, he, June was the manager. And she has a gallery now down on Broadway, yeah. June Kelly Gallery. Um, let's go back to Chester's. Um, and talk a little bit about those that relationship, the way that you capture like the warmth of those relationships. Well, you know, so this is, uh, you know, he was, he had both sides to him. He had the public side and he had, you know, the personal private side. And this was his brain trust, so to speak, uh, with Ed, uh, Norman and Lewis and um, uh, uh, Frank, tell me the name of the, the, the painter. That's uh, Critchlow, Ernie Critchlow. <laughs> I don't know who this other guy is, the young guy. Yeah, he's ugly, isn't he? But you know, <laughs> you know who that is? <laughs> he's very intense, rather, I should say. Yeah, but this on the Chris Loader, and it's a Senke Gallery, you can see it's in the It's a Senke Gallery. He's probably trying to make, trying to convince them that he should have a show. Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah, yeah he, he looks like he's in, in that mood. He's, he's, whoever, he's pitching. Whoever he's that pitching. is, he, he, he looks he, like he's not doing a good job of it either. Right, right. But he's pitching themselves and then, you know, and Norman is listening. But as you were saying, these guys are tough. You oh, know, they were tough. They were tough. They were tough. They were tough critics, man. Robbie may give him an audience, but these other guys are listening. They say, oh, well, we don't know. We don't know about that. So, but this is, this is how Romy holds court with his friends, with his fellow board members at the gallery. Well, and let me just say this too. Romy uh, liked company. He, he didn't like to be alone. Mm -hmm. And he got that from his mother. His mother was the same way. She didn't like to be alone. So he surrounded himself with his boys all the time. <laughs> and these were two of his boys. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, and, and Al and, and, um, and um, Ellison were the, the, another group of boys. Yeah. Ralph Ellison, yeah, and Al, Al Murray, yep. Oh, yeah. Murray was one of his ace boon coons. So they ace boon coon. And then <laughs> Harry, Harry was another one who he did the books with. Um, Harry Black. Henderson, yeah, Harry Henderson was, uh, he was there. Yep, and uh, uh, Love, uh, I forget his first name, another painter friend of his. Um, so, you know, he had all these, he, he, he felt the energy of all of these guys and they all fed each other and that was very good. You know, Romy, uh, I don't know about you, but Romy used to tell many stories, some of those I, I remember, uh, about how he started painting, you know, because he used to do, you know, back uh, in, the, in, the, in the beginning, he would do uh, figurative, you know, stuff. But he says that he had, he had a drought, went through a period of, of a, like a writer's block, a painter's block, and he had a gallery in his mother's building up on 125th Street. And, he, and there was a, a woman who cleaned the building and he had this canvas on his easel and it had been there for a few months and he hadn't put anything on it because he'd been thinking, what would he put on it? And one day he's there, he comes in and the cleaning lady is there and she says, you know, um, uh, and he was sitting down and she says, why don't you paint me? And Romy turned around, not wanting to insult her, <laughs> because he was trying to come up with a deep thought thing. And, uh, and he said, well, he says, well, he paused and she said, well, if you call yourself a painter, if you can paint me, then you can paint anything. <laughs> so she was, she was kind of homely. So, oh, uh, so said, you find the beauty in me. Oh, boy. You, you're a great painter. So Robbie took that as a challenge and that got him out of his, his doldrum of not being able to paint for that particular period. Um, that story reminds me, it helps transition actually, because you talked just about the way that Romare Bearden taught you about the benefits of limitations of challenges that end up generating creativity. 
And so I'm wondering if we can pivot to the next slide, but also to the next topic, which is about Virgin as a mentor to you. Um, and Chester, you already began to bring this up, but I, I wanted to bring this juxtaposition to you all as a proposal to talk a little bit about uh, Romer Bearden's influence on your photography, on the kinds of work that you, you have done. Um, and I'm particularly um, inspired, this juxtaposition is inspired by Ralph Ellison, who writes so eloquently about Bearden's ability to take on uh, stereotypical representations of African Americans, what he calls a stubborn blindness, and bring a new <laughs> world order. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear the sirens behind me, I apologize. Um, and so, you know, Romare Bearden, I mean, sorry, Ralph Ellison talks about that the problem for the artist, the plastic artist, is not one of telling, but of re revealing um, that which uh, has been concealed by time, by custom, or by our trained incapacity to perceive the truth. And I think um, you both have talked about this as well. So um, I, I, I wonder if you can if you respond to the juxtaposition or just to the ways that Romare Bearden really um, mentored you in seeing and revealing the truth. Oh, go ahead, Frank. Well, you know, he, he uh, led by example. So he didn't really do a lot of talking to you because he didn't know too much about photography, you know. He uh, would talk about great artists like Rembrandt, uh, Picasso. Picasso was one of his great uh, mentors and stuff like that. So, um, I mean, you just had to uh, get what you needed from him by asking him questions. But what about like how you represent black people, especially back in, you know, in the 60s when you all were creating imagery that, you know, wasn't in the mainstream. What what was he telling you um and what in what ways do do works like Dove which really show a street scene and but in a way that's not like the kind of downtrodden, you know, under-resourced Harlem, right? Is there, are there ways that you all were you picking up your camera at that time? You, you know, I was a friend of a, a famous uh, a photographer named James Van Der Zee. So, you know, I told, I asked him one day, I said, man, you, you never shoot these bums in the street around here? Because <laughs> he was from Harlem. And uh, he said, oh no, I, I want to uplift the race. You know, I, I, I don't show the downtrodden, so. We kind of have that in common that we don't we don't show we try not to show the downtrodden. We, we try trying to show uplifting of the race. Yeah, I I think that you know the first of all, I think we're all in the business. Romy and us are all in the business of restructuring the context, the visual context, the visual document, and how you see people of color. I tell people who ask me, white people who ask me, what well, do you do those, you know, poor, poor, poor pictures and what have you? And I said, well, people don't need me to do that. There are far too many other people who are better than me doing that. <laughs> but none of them can see what I'm seeing. So, um, and and so when I think that we came to Romy, and Romy is a mentor, was a mentor to us, and a mentor works well if they don't have to do your work but you come into the life from time to time where you reach a point, you reach a crossroads. I remember during the same time I met Romy, I met Gordon Parks and I was, and Gordon said, well, what do you wanna do? And I must have had the same conversation with Romy, but not being a photographer, he wouldn't have responded to it the way Gordon did. But his Gordon response, well, okay. I says, look, I wanna change the way, uh, how are people seen? I wanna show, you know, what li uh, lifts us up. Uh, so Gordon says, well, okay, if that's how you feel, there's 36 rolls, 36 frames on a roll of film. When you get an assignment from a white editor to go and photograph us, and you shoot the 35 images the way you're telling me now, that's fine. But if you make a mistake and you shoot the 36 image the way that they have normally been socialized to see, that would be the one they use. So if you don't want them to use that picture, don't make it. So I think Romy was a trick for both of us because we had already had a sense of clarity about what our role should be and our responsibility to the race. I think you have to say that Frank and I both are fundamentally race people. Romy's work is fundamentally that of a race person. 
And our race needed us because we are in a whole sea of nothing but negative images, images that are fostered and thrust upon us by a media that hates us as a individually and as a people. So then we know that that world that they are looking that that outsiders see is corrupted. Uh, I don't see the reason why we should add to that corruption. And we were also influenced by, I was by the nation of Islam. And one of the things that really stuck to me is one of the things Elijah Muhammad says is that we are, we become what we consume. Yeah. Whether that's food, whether that's in imagery, whether that's in culture, whatever. So our job, all three of us, is about producing something that our people can consume. Yeah. That speaks to the inner greatness of us. That speaks to our sense of worthiness not our sense of, uh, of despair and, and, uh, and victimization. Yeah, totally. And the joy that's in the photographs here on view, I mean, just speak to that. Well, to tell you the truth, uh, this is why I got into photography in the first place, because there were so many negative images of black folks in the community that uh, I, at the time I was living in Chicago and we wanted to show the positivity of, of the community, not the negativity. So that's kind of why I started taking pictures in the first place. And thanks. <clears throat> and we have to thank Frank and people like Frank, who had that same motivation. Yeah. To because we are we are reconstructionists, so to speak. Yes. And and that's a very valuable thing. Our children need to be able to see a positive reflection of their of themselves yeah. in the lives of people who look like them. I think it's such a tragedy that our children are taught in history in school that our history began with slavery. Our history did not begin when a white man came into our life. Slavery is an interruption of our history, but our historians don't teach it. They don't know it themselves because that history, that knowledge has also been uh, uh, hijacked. Critical <laughs> race yeah. theory. <laughs> Okay, well, yes, let's continue this conversation. This is so good and we we could talk for so much longer. We can um, go through these and get to, um, I asked each of you to send slides that talk a little bit more directly about um, Beard's this is influence a, this on is your such, photographic practice. This is a great picture. Isn't it? Yeah. This um, is, uh, this is, this is uh, Romy's <laughs> influence on me in terms of uh, breaking up space. You know, he, he said, if you take the, if you take the people out of his, uh, collages you got a Mondrian, you know, and uh, his 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 composition was very static, and this is the composition similar to his in terms of how static it is and how the people just sit there, but they're placed in a nice position. Um, we could go to the next. So I took the liberty of selecting a couple others that, <laughs> to me, um, intrigue me in, like, in relation that? to his work. Um, you know, Bearden's use of <clears throat> an abstraction and using creating signs that speak for other things. This work um, jumped out at me for the ways that it connects. Um, I, this is a uh, uh, Winton Marcellus, a young Winton Marcellus, uh, in a classroom giving a lecture on. Uh, structure of jazz music. Let's go to so the okay. he becomes the instrument itself. Um we can talk a little bit about jazz as well. <clears throat> I, I know you all you both brought it up. I, I, I before we talk about the specific photo, I'm wondering have did you all listen did you sit in a room and listen to jazz with, with Bearden or listen to music and and um uh, I, um, yeah, I'll stop there. And then we'll but, but, no, I didn't, but look at Bearden's picture. Mm -hmm. Bearden, to me, fragments time, all of his work, fractionalizes time. You can you look at the man's hands and the movement of his face, and you know there's a sound. It comes to you. Yes. And it's in a, in a static way because it's a painting, but he understood something about the brain. Mm -hmm. because He said to me, he says, look, <clears throat> The eye is the one sense that that um, that feels all five senses. Each sense unto itself, whether well, it's you know feel uh, into itself or uh, is real, 
but the eye combines them all. And his example was that if you look at a, an advertising at the time where you see a sizzling steak and you see the sizzle and you see the smoke coming off of it and it's shot below and it really captures that meat cooking, you can taste it from the eye. Yeah. If you are seeing, looking out of your window a block away and you see somebody shoot somebody in the head, it's out of the range of your sound, but your eye instantaneously make you feel it. So he was someone who believed in all of those senses wrapped up in the eye mm -hmm. and that you can reach all of those senses through the eye. Yeah. You can make all of those senses respond. And I think this is a perfect example. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you want to add on to that? The, the, the sensorial effect um, that Bearden was able to accomplish and how you did, how you did that? I mean, for the last de couple of decades, especially working uh, with Winter Marsalis, Frank? Well, this this painting, this uh, painting, has a painting on the left. I remember when he did it, he didn't have the traces in the sticks at the time. And I say, you know, photography, if I had shot that, I, you know, you could see the traces of the sticks. So <laughs> I think he put that in there <laughs> awesome. after that, after that conversation. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide. Um, this was just another one I selected thinking about um, jazz turned into the visual form. Yeah, this was a, a hard one to, to take, uh, to orchestrate this composition to where it had some kind of meaning because it was just a lot of people and a lot of white and a lot of <laughs> instruments. And this is the baptism in uh, Harlem. Uh, Father Divine, I think, uh, every every June, he baptizes his congregation again with the fire hose in the street. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting time to be there. Okay, Chester, you sent in some photographs um, to talk about Bearden's influence on you and your work. Well, here's um, here's a. a, a picture that, that's very uh, simple, uh, but um, the elements of, with the elements of nature, but also a breaking space. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's a picture, uh, what could be uh, look like an African uh, piece of sculpture that's in front of this man when it's actually, uh, I watched, I saw this man de demarcate a space on the beach by drawing uh, a square and then placing his son down and then putting a Bible to his head and praying over it. And for me, the, the roar of the ocean was, was very much there and the sunrise, all of that, the, those natural elements were at work, and, but um, it needed uh, something to break it. And, and thankfully uh, this swimmer decided to go out into the surf and raising his arm and also as a, as a cross leg became the, the, the perfect sort of uh, uh, reflection to what was going on in the in the foreground and all of it pulling together this this whole thing. Romy used to show me pictures that these photographers had made in in Africa of ch mostly children playing and it and it, in children playing in the surf. So I began to spend time at the surf in, in early morning hours uh, and in certain Sundays uh, at the uh, uh, Osu Castle Beach, you have all these religious people coming in Accra and doing their ceremonies. And this is how that came to be. Let's go to the next. You also mentioned <clears throat> um, the way that Romeo Bearden influenced your use of light. Can I talk about yes. That? Well, you know, he was, he, he introduced me. I would come and I was showing my work. And Romeo had this, when I met Romeo, he had these um, Saturday morning um, uh, courts that he would hold. He will give um, you know artists who want to have an exhibition to show their work or talk about their work. Uh, he will give you a time. It's like going to see a therapist. Give you a time that you could show up. And um, luckily, uh, he put me in. He put me in the mix. And I think my time was either ten o'clock or eleven o'clock. And um, you would show up at Romy's house on Wooster and the Canal. And he, you could ring the doorbell downstairs, but the door didn't have a buzzer that would open for you. 
So he would have to raise the window, look to see who's downstairs, and then drop the keys to you, and then use those keys to get in and go up to his floor. And then when you leave, you let somebody else in who's downstairs generally. But when he looked at my work, um, Romy each time was, he spent many of, many of visits were all on light. And he taught me light by looking, going into his library and bringing down books of Caravaggio, Rimbaud, David, Vermeer, Cezanne. And he would say, you know, <clears throat> over time, I began to learn that it was a certain personality about light. And he was telling me that, well, how light strikes this and then it, how it becomes the verb, how it begins to give it, how it activates something that's there. And that activation is usually because it's, it's contrasted to something dark, which you see in the, in the uh, 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 Italian Renaissance painters. Now, also during that same time, he was teaching me a thing about ceremony. You know, he did this book on ceremony. He saw life as a ceremony. And he's and he and which was very instructive for me as a photographer because it gave me some uh, distance to uh, to be more accurate about where I would enter to look for the photograph. Now his example was um, <clears throat> let's take if you were uh, uh, if you were observing a couple and uh, they all and they turned towards each other and they started to kiss. Well now. If you know, obviously in, in, in photography or people, the more you know about yourself, the, the more you can, can pull a lot out of what's looking, what's in front of you. So he was saying, well, you know, the first thing that may happen is that they touch and hold hands and then the eyes lock into a gaze and then they move around uh, to be face to face with each other. And then there's the embrace. And then there's the bit, there's the, the staring of the eyes and the bending of the, of the neck. Uh, of the head, and then there is the, the 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 touching of the lips, and then there is the caressing of the arms, and there's there's a squeeze, and then there is the let go, and then there is the uh, uh, looking back at each other from uh, from a distance, and then there is the mellowness of the moment, and then it's a different kind of hand. So he was saying to me that look, if you look at anything in life, it goes from A to Z. And so if you know as a photographer that your picture is the hand, then you know that you grafted it, you're looking for when the moment gets to see. Or if, you're for, if, you're, if your image is that of the kiss, you know to preposition yourself when the moment gets to M. Mm. Or if the, moment is, you know, if the moment you're looking for is in the afterglow, then you know where Y exists, and then you position yourself to Y. Another example he gave of the same thing was if you go to a restaurant and he says, okay, A, as you walk into the door, B, you look around, C, a waiter comes to you, D, takes you uh, to your table, E, you sit down, F, you get the menu, H, you get the water, I, you then make an order, J, the, the waiter runs back, L, brings the food, M, you start to eat, and then all of it until Z, when you walk out of that door. Everything is a ceremony. And if you can graft that ceremony, then that becomes more advantageous to you in terms of how you are in control of the moment, mm -hmm. control of the picture. That's why I tell people, says Romy, I tell people I don't take pictures, I make pictures. Mm -hmm. Because Romy was so much into the, the, the intellectualism of art, the show you may call the scholarly art, but he was into what I call the linguistics of the moment, of the ceremony. And uh, it was just incredible for a young person to find someone who could speak to me in those sort of terms. They helped me visualize the, uh, and help me put that so that I could put that to work. And here's another example, watching these boys in the spray and in, in outside of Krav Ghana, yeah. playing with the surf. The surf is very powerful, but you know, young people are daring, nothing can happen to them. And here you have the boys waiting to be splashed and the Atlantic Ocean boom, barreling in on them. That's so beautiful. I'm gonna keep this phrase, the linguistics of the moment and, and the way that ceremony and light come together in a photograph. We are running close to the end of our conversation. So we're gonna, I'm gonna ask to, you know- Oh, that's Benny, that's Benny Andrews. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Bob, Bob Carey. 
Also, uh, he did a he did a uh, a whole portfolio of pieces called the Prevalence of Ritual. Yes, and I thought that was such a beautiful title. Yep, totally. that uh, Chester was just talking about. Yeah, I think. Yep. Yeah. So this is uh, Van der Zee and. Hey, that's my picture of Gordon, but I'm. Uh, yeah, I brought it together because of the photography. And Benny connection. Andrews. Yeah. At a place that's called Knob Carry down down Soho. Ah. Back in the day. Benny was one of his favorites. Yeah, Benny was one of his favorites, and Benny was from Georgia. Ah, okay. Yeah, rural Georgia. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm from rural Alabama. I'm from a town of 800 people. I'm from a little village. Oh, one, tra one, one traffic light. Benny was a sharecropper. He, his father was a sharecropper. So oh, okay. He okay. was from a town. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, you so, you so route two box. Yeah, 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 something like that. Yeah. <laughs> So let's, um, another photography, um, photographer cameo, you both just are connected and have these er narratives of being linked to these phenomenal foundational black photographers, Paige Polk, Bobby Sainstack. Well, my, my mentor was uh, Roy DiCaravo. He, he was my teacher and whatnot. Yeah. A lot of people came through uh, Gordon, but I yeah. came through Roy DiCaravo. So let's let's go on to the last topic before we turn it over to audience questions, which is what it means to capture creativity. Um, Frank, would you like to tell us a little bit about? You know, you, you almost never see Romy uh, working. So uh, he had a he had a ritual in 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 the day mm. where he would come in and he would work very hard in the morning until like noon, and then he would receive after that. <laughs> so. He, he wasn't supposed to have a phone there. You see a phone right there where he would uh, receive his calls after afternoon. So this is, uh, I think he's, work he's working on a collage here and he worked uh, flat. So he didn't work on an easel. He worked on, uh, he had to work on uh, flat on a table. Um, we're gonna skip, we'll just linger on the next one. I pulled these because to me, it seems like one of the challenges of capturing creativity is making the the invisible internal process of thinking and, and processing external. And so um, that's where I was going with these selections. Since Frank, you talked about that one slide. Um, Chester, I've been, we have your Elder Grace uh, portfolio here at the Schomburg and so I, even though this is not an artist, I thought the idea of kind of capturing spirit on the other one, on the one hand, and then like the intellectual process um, really um, is in your Elder Grace series. And so I wondered if you would like to talk about this. I also have the picture um, that you took here at the Schomburg of Maya Angelou and, and Amiri Baraka. So I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide which one of the two you want to talk about as the last thing. <laughs> well, you know. Was that the one dancing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a beautiful photograph. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. And this is Dr. John Henry Clark. You know, when I first came to New York, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm into, I'm, I'm, I was really uh, pulled by his research and his lectures. And I would go, he was another one that I would go visit him, uh, not on Saturdays, but during the week. And sit. Uh, he had owned a brownstone on Strivers Row. And he had his library and his office down in the, in the uh, garden apartment. And I would go and I would just spend hours, be spellbound. He had such a memory. He could tell you what he whatever he was telling, talking to you about. He could say, well, it's in that book that's on the top left of, the, of, of my library on that shelf. And it's on page 245 and it's paragraph six. And I go get it. And I find the book and I open it up and I go, and he's right, it's there. He has such a memory. So here, here he is, he's blind. But his mind is what I found so attractive and I knew that it was so active. And the challenge here was, to I felt, was how do you show uh, a cerebral activity in someone who just, ever, to everybody else, it just looked like his, as his eyes closed and that's okay. But the, how to appreciate and show cerebral activity in a person who is not paying attention to you and their eyes are closed. And that was my challenge. And that's what I, and because I knew him that's, and I could feel him, that's what that produced. Now, the other picture, the, the dance picture. So, well, I, yeah, 
I think that we only have 10 more minutes, right? Before oh, we okay, well then let's, let's go. Let's, let's go. <laughs> Sorry about that. But we'll see it. This is a, such an iconic <clears throat> photograph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> such a beautiful, joyous uh, photograph. There's Romy. Yep. I told him not to smile. Hey, man, no smile. You know, I want to get a serious picture. <laughs> and he's smiling all the time, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is my contact sheet of uh, visiting him. Because I would make pictures, and then I would uh, make contact sheets and give it to him. This is when he, I see it in, in uh, Frank's image in the beginning. He had converted that space where he used to have a couch and a table that something looked more modern there now. But uh, this is a typical uh, visit uh, at Romy's uh, on a, some Saturday afternoon or morning. And when He's you went of, there, when you went there, they had the plastic on the furniture like old folks in the South. <laughs> <laughs> you slid off the couch, you know, you sit on there and then you be sliding off the couch. And this is, is their flat was essentially, uh, one end was a kitchen, in the middle was a was a uh, with, with a table dining table, and then in the middle was a sitting room, and then in the front was their uh, was their bedroom and the library. I think I remember that correctly. Frank, is that is that? Do you remember it like that? Yeah, and he had a TV in the middle because he liked to look at the ball games. You know, he was, oh, you know, he was a pitcher for the uh, Pittsburgh Crawfords back in the day. Oh, interesting. Yeah. interesting. And since he went to college, they called him schoolboy. <laughs> We interesting. Can, interesting. Oh man, this is so exciting. Um, I, yeah. I think that I'm sure some uh, audience members will want to ask you to expound on this. So maybe we should. Um, maybe yeah, this is a Kamara Holloway joining you. I'm the project manager for the catalog resume. Um, and I just like to invite you to put your questions in the chat if you have any. We would love to take questions from the audience. But maybe. Um, to finish your recollections, you could tell us, uh, each of you, um, if you have a favorite bearded memory, like the sharpest, most favorite <clears throat> memory that you have of him. Well, let me, let me say, the first, when I first met him, I met him uh, doing a documentary on two, two centuries of Black art in America. He was the first one, and it was a, uh, July day, a hot July day, like a hundred degrees. And he lived on the top floor and the, the, the stairs, the ceilings were like 12 feet. So the stairs were like forever. And we go up there and we were dripping. Everybody was sweating, even he was sweating, you know? So that was my first one. He told me to come back the next day, talk to me, you know, and he, he needed photographs or something. And I said, okay, yeah, I can do that. I didn't know how to photograph art. <laughs> but I, I found out real quick. I learned real quick how to photograph art. <laughs> well, it's interesting. He asked me to do the same thing, and I admit, I said, Romy, I can't do that. That's not what I do. You need somebody else. No, to I can look. I can do. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> you know, I didn't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. do either of you? Oh, go ahead, Chester. I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, you know, Romy was a mentor that you, and I think that everybody wished they had, uh, because he he listens to you, and but then he he takes it in, and then he leads you to a resource that 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 uh, inspires you to continue down that line, uh, to improve that thinking, and then you know, as Frank says, you know, you go with him to Sinke, you go with him being surrounded by other people and you see that that there's a possibility that a black artist can survive that there is a way he's paving a way um that and, and he's in many different levels how he's paving it but his example is that wow you know keep doing what you're doing i know his 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 advice to me once was that <clears throat> don't deviate from the path don't jump from here to there keep going where you're going keep following it Stay focused on it, and it's all going to work out. And um, I, I accepted that as gospel, and it, it was something I would have done anyway. But to have someone uh, validate it for me like that was just uh, was very meaningful to my life. Wonderful. 
And so how are you continuing now to carry on these um, ideas that were ingrained in you? Like, what are you working on currently? Well, you know, Romy, um, uh, Romy's thing was a, a love for his people. That's the bottom line. And my work is continuing that. I did, uh, I'm now just finished my seventh book. And this book is on Africa. It's on, uh, the, this is my second, uh, third book on Africa, actually. Uh, and it's called A Sacred Nile. It looks at our history before slavery. The history of people of African descent started along the Nile. It didn't start in West Africa. And that's a whole history that has to be put in sharp relief. Uh, and it can be based upon what's there the stone that's left behind, the messages in stone, the architecture left behind. Uh, and I remember uh, Romy sent me out to photograph some of his friends. So he sent me to photograph, uh, uh, and one of his friends was Ralph Ellison. And Ralph Ellison and I both had something in common because we both went to Tuskegee. I, it was, so his book at Tuskegee was required reading. And um, Ralph asked me, he said, well, uh, okay, well, after we got over to Tuskegee party, he said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I just spent the summer in Africa. He said, in Africa? <laughs> he says, you know, he, he said, we haven't lost anything in Africa. We're, um, Af we're Americans, African-Americans. And um, I, you know, I, 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 I respectfully uh, listen, hear, hearing him out, he's my elder. And he's a friend of Romy's, but I also felt if he's a friend of Romy, Romy is doing things on Africa. So they must have had this conversation. And Ralph, and, and maybe Romy sent me up here to have that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he was, you know, very much about uh, the things that the African American, the Negro, has achieved. He wasn't into African American yet. Uh, and his uh, and his other Romy's other friend, the writer. Uh, Al Murray felt the same way. Yeah. I understood their investment. I was not, uh, I was, I can't deny that I'm American, but I can't also deny that I have an African part of me. And, that I, and I won't apologize for the fact that because I've been going there back and forth relating to my cousins over the summers. I mean, people have homes, people have TV, people have radio, people have uh, cars, people have air conditioning. They have everything we have. I'm not going to. Awesome. I'm not going to distance myself from from my African cousins. But I understood really where coming from, so I just tried to either not press it to have an argument, or I tried to hope that my work can bring them along. Mm -hmm. um, but um, that that was the two worlds that we young people were standing between: the world of where we were, our energy and our passion was taking us, our willpower was taking us, and the world of those artists and intellectuals like Romy who showed us that we stood upon. And um, it's, it makes it, it, and it has made a very interesting blend. Yeah, thank you. And Frank, what, are, um, besides your retrospective, what um, new directions are you taking? Um, I'm printing for that retrospective right now, you know, um... The book is coming out. It's called Next. Uh, Rizzoli is printing it, so uh, it'll be out so shortly. Um, and yeah, I, I had the same conversation with Al Murray about Africans. You know, he he didn't give Africans that much uh, do. You know, and I, man, I see, you know, jazz came from Africa. <laughs> he wanted to say <laughs> jazz came from Europe. You know? <laughs> Come on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> give it up. Give it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he wasn't one to argue with, so uh, I would just listen to him. Whenever he was in the car and with Romy, I didn't have anything to say. I would just listen. That's right. That's right. That's right. Listen to listen to the elders. Yeah, you know, listen to the elders. Listen to the elders. This is what they think. Fine. Okay. I'll I'll go in one ear and out the other. Okay. Right. Um. Okay. There is a question um, from the audience, and um, is there a image that you wish you had taken of Bearden? If he was alive, would he be painting in that image? I got images of Romy <clears throat> painting <laughs> when he was alive. So, I, you know, it would be nice if he was alive just to talk to him. 
I don't know if he would be painting now. He, you know, he was an old cat when he died. So, and I, I love the relationship of he and, and Annette. Um, you know, they had no children, uh, and Annette was very much love kids. She had a, a, a dance group that she worked with children, and Romy was very, very supportive of her, and and they were, they were both supportive of each other. Uh, that that was a very good relationship to observe. Well, also, uh, man, that had seven sisters, and a few of them had children. Ah, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, yeah. Had she had seven sisters, and uh, Deidre is one of the nieces. Deidre Harris. Yes, Kelly. dude. Deidre Harris Kelly is. One yeah, of she's the one of the nieces. nieces. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes. Um, one last question, because we're running out of time, <clears throat> is um, both of you. What are your plans for your archives? We're we're an archive, so we're interested in where people are planning to deposit their materials if they if they have such a plan. Well, I'm going through my gallery, and I are going through that now. But you know, uh, but uh, my uh, lawyer had advised me that before you know, before you do a distribution on your uh, or in your will or a final archive thing if there's stuff that you want to give away now give it away and that's why I've given two exhibitions to the Schomburg. Uh one was on religion and one was on elders uh, and I have and at some point uh, I'll, I'll be ready for uh, someone from the Schomburg to visit to take a look at my uh, uh, my library collection because I'm sure I have a lot of things that uh, that are unique uh, about Africa that they may not have and I don't, but I don't know if they want them but um, in the in the uh, uh, that's where I'm at the other thing is that my alma mater Tuskegee is interested in my and it, and then there's a it's another museum that's interested so I have a, a lot of things to to consider in the next couple of years Okay, great. And Frank, are you making plans for your archive? Well, I've been approached by a few people. Emory is one of the places that approached me. But you know, I have two daughters and uh, they're gonna they're gonna make all those decisions after I'm gone. <laughs> so uh, that's what's happening. Okay. Well, we want to Thank you both because you have enriched us with your conversation and we are looking forward to your upcoming projects and to your um, continued uh, to, to be able to see your works in your archive. So and send people to my website, sacrednow.com. Yes. Okay, sacrednile.com. And yeah. then the retrospective is open at the Phillips Collection in June of June 2023. Of 2023, right. Yes. Um, so both of you, thank you for a rich and rewarding conversation. And thank you, Delila, for moderating. We appreciate you joining us at this You endeavor. did a beautiful job, Delila. Thank you. Thank you. It yeah. was wonderful talking with and you. And thanks, Will and Steen, for having us. Yes, we're delighted. And you can see their photographs and more photographs of Bearden at WPI.art. So don't forget to check out the website. And with that, I will say thank you for joining us and good night all. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.